Welcome back to Cardades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series six months of set theory and higher order logic. In this video we're going to be looking at does the universe only contain the null set? So in the previous video we mentioned that once we assume axiom 3 we've shown that the universe can't be identical to the null set. Since due to Russell's paradox the universe can't be a member of itself and the null set is a member of the universe. However, we have not shown that the universe cannot simply be the set of the null set, the class whose only member is the null set. This set, or class, is represented as bracket null set bracket. Remember that the class of the null set and the null set are not identical since the null set has no members, while the class of the null set has one member, namely the null set. In fact, as we will prove in this video, with only axioms 1 through 3, we cannot show that the universe is anything more than the class of the null set. Since the class of the null set fulfills all three axioms, it is transitive, it is swelled, and it contains the null set. So in other words, our goal is to prove the following statement. This statement should look a little bit familiar if you watched the previous video, because the first two parts are basically the same. All it's say, doing is saying that this set is transitive, this set is swelled, but we're adding the third axiom. So we're adding in that the null set is a member of this set. Note that this does not prove that the class of the null set is in fact the universal class merely that our axioms have not yet shown that it cannot be. But don't try this yet. We need one more definition before we can really do this formally. We need to define exactly what we mean by bracket null set bracket. For now, instead of creating a general schema to define curly brackets, because that's going to be a lot more complicated than we need, we're just going to define that as its own symbol. And it's a symbol which means that for all classes A, A is a member of bracket null set bracket is materially equivalent to A is identical to the null set. Or in other words, for any class A, if and only if A is a member of the, null, of the set of the null set, then A is the null set. We're going to call this bracket null set bracket definition in proofs. So with that, Let's get started. Pause the video if you want to try it on your own, but as you can see by the size of the print, it's going to be a long one. All right? So, first off, we'll use the definition we just got, and then we're going to universally instantiate the null set itself in for A. We'll use the null set is equal to the null set, that's just identity. And then using premise 2 and equivalence, we're going to break apart that by conditional into two conditionals so that we end up with just one conditional, which is that if the null set equals the null set, then the null set is a member of the class of the null set. And by modus ponens, we get the null set is a member of the class of the null set. That is our first of the three parts that we needed to get. That's the last one, rather, that we needed to get. Now we're going to try to prove the other ones. So... First off, we're going to look at this membership one. So this is proving that this class of the null set is transitive. So we're going to do an assumed indirect proof. We're going to deny that this is the case. We'll do change of quantifier twice to turn those universal quantifiers into existential quantifiers. We'll existentially instantiate this. We're going to use implication to turn that implication into a disjunction so that we can use De Morgan's rule to distribute that negation across the disjunction. So now we have some nice conjunctions that we can simplify things out of. We get A is a member of B and B is a member of the class the null set. We can universally instantiate premise one once again to get B is a member of the class of the null set if and only if B is equal to the null set. Equivalence and simplification will turn that into a normal conditional. And simplification of premise 12 will get us the antecedent of that conditional so that modus ponens will show us that B is equal to the null set. But we can also simplify down premise 12 to get A as a member of B. Uh-oh, if A is a member of B and B is equal to the null set, we've got a contradiction. But we haven't explicitly proven it yet. We've just shown that we can get there. So by identity and 17 and 18, 
A is a member of the null set. By the definition of the null set for all B, B is not a member of the null set. So A is not a member of the null set. So it's not the case that A is a member of the null set. So it's not the case that A is a member of the null set and A is a member of the null set by 1922 conjunction. That is a contradiction. So we have now proven the second to last part of our statement through 7 through 23 indirect proof. That's the statement about transitivity. Now we have to get to swelled. This is going to take a little bit longer. Whew. All right. So same as with transitivity, we're going to assume the negation of this claim. We're going to use our change of quantifier twice, and then we're going to instantiate both those variables, x and y into c and d, respectively. Then, once again, we're going to do implication to do that, and then this is incorrect. Instead of 27 implication, this should read 28 de Morgan's rule. Then we'll do 29 simplification. We'll simplify that nice conjunction down to just part of it. And we'll simplify it further to C is a subset of D. Then we'll look at the subclass definition. And we're going to instantiate this, the C and D into the subclass definition and then do our identity rule to plug them in. So we just basically have for all U, U as a member of C implies that U is a member of D. That's just the definition of C being a subclass of D. We also have that D is a member of the class of the null set. And by the same tricks that we used earlier when we found that B was a member of the class of the null set, we're going to show that D is equal to the null set, which should just intuitively make sense. If D is a member of a class whose only member is the null set, then D must be the null set. We also have C is a member of the set of the null set is materially equivalent to C is the null set. From 34 equivalents, This should read 38 equivalents, excuse me. That's just copying and pasting. Basically, we're doing the exact same thing with C that we just did with D. But instead of showing that C is a member of the class of the null set, therefore C is identical to the null set, we're going to show that it's not the case that C is a member of the class of the null set, therefore C is not identical to the null set, because this is a biconditional. So, using modus tollens going back. Next up, we'll look at our null set definition. We're going to instantiate that to T. So we have, it's not the case that T is a member of D. And we have, from 32 universal instantiation, T is a member of C implies that T is a member of D. We have, it's not the case that T is a member of C from 46, 47 modus tollens. So by non-membership definition, T is not a member of C. And then we can go ahead and universally generalize. Remember when we came up with T, that was from a universal statement. That was from our universal null set definition. So we can universally generalize that up to B. So for all B, B is not a member of C. And by our null set definition, for all A, if the null set is equal to A, that's materially equivalent to, for all B, B is not a member of A. We're going to universally instantiate C in there. And then we're going to split apart that implication and simplify it down to, for all B, if B is not a member of C, that implies that C is identical to the null set. By modus ponens, not modus tollens, that's another mistake, that should be modus ponens, the null set is equal to C from 50 and 54. And therefore, we have the null set is equal to C, and it's not the case that C is equal to the null set that via conjunction that is going to be a contradiction. So we can conclude for all x and all y, x is a subclass of y, and y is a member of the class of the null set implies that 
x is a member of the class of the null set. 25 through 55, indirect proof. Sorry for all of those typos. The individual lines themselves should be fine, but sometimes the explanation of how we got there is false. For bonus and extra credit points, find all of the mistakes in here if there are any that I'd missed. All right, then we're just going to conjoin up all of the three premises that we got so far to get our big long statement that the class of the null set satisfies axioms one, axiom two, and axiom three, and can be, at least at this point, the universal class. Woo! Up next, what is a proper subset? It'll be a nice, easy break from the complicated proofs we've been doing. Watch this video and more here at carnadius.org and stay skeptical, everybody.